This presentation is from my perspective as a diver in the recovery of a B-25C aircraft from the bottom of Lake Murray in South Carolina. My friend Scott Powell had stayed on me for many years to try and get me to come and do this presentation for the Down Under Scuba Club. Finally, in September of 2011, I did agree and we had some information on what had actually happened to the aircraft after it was recovered that I thought was worthy of, of presenting to the team. Scott passed away a few years ago, but I really appreciate the effort that he put into making me pull all of this information together into one place. It really means a lot to see this project documented this way. The Doolittle Raid on 18 April 1942 was the first air raid by the United States to strike the Japanese home islands during World War II. By demonstrating that Japan itself was vulnerable to American air attack, it provided a vital morale boost for the, an opportunity for the U.S. retaliation against the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor on 7 December 1941. The raid was planned and led by Lieutenant Colonel James Jimmy Doolittle. Skip bombing was a low-level bombing technique that was developed by an Italian pilot who was flying a German aircraft. He was making attacks on Allied ships off the coast of North Africa between May and October of 1941. After Pearl Harbor, it was used against the Imperial Japanese Navy warships by Major William Benn. You can see in the photo here how pilots would fly really close to the water and drop the bomb so they would skip along the top of the water like they might do a rock across a lake. After it proved successful, a lot of training for skip bombing occurred over Lake Murray in South Carolina. For the aircraft we were tasked with recovering, the pilot had 228 flight hours, 32 of those hours had been in B-25s, and 20 hours in B-25Cs specifically. For those of us that do accident analysis, I did find it interesting that they credit the pilot for being 95% responsible for the accident while the faulty engine was only 5% responsible. The engine failure occurred at 500 feet. With such low experience, he might have been unfairly blamed. This B-25 was a rare bird, a time capsule that had not been disturbed. It was determined that it would be displayed indoors, not flown, and preserved in its original World War II state. It would be placed in a venue that was open for, to the public and teach future generations about the history of World War II and the region's contributions to the war effort. In 1999, the Lake Murray B-25 Rescue Project Incorporated was founded. In 2004, the Southern Museum of Flight in Birmingham, Alabama was selected as the final resting place for this historic aircraft. The three gentlemen pictured here are the ones that really drove this project. They located the aircraft, they went through all the hoops to put this project together and really assembled the team that made this happen. Their hard work was recognized by the state of South Carolina when they were awarded the Order of the Palmetto in 2008. Given how deep the wreck was, they enlisted the help of a local technical diver named Chris Elmore. Chris assembled the team of divers and we all came together online mainly to discuss what our logistics were going to be and how we were going to pull this project off. Chris passed away in 2008 from a brain cancer, but the crustacean you see at the bottom of the page here was named after him and forever immortalizes his passion and his hard work. Many of us in the diving community were impacted by Chris. The major advantage of using volunteer divers for this as opposed to commercial divers was that it didn't require the team to have a recompression chamber available directly on site. There's also some other OSHA guidelines that we were able to not have to directly be impacted with simply because we were not paid employees. We knew that the aircraft was located in 150 feet of fresh water, so we needed to decide what type of trimix were we going to use and then what did we want to plan for our decompression gas selection. Logistical challenges being out in the middle of a lake and then having to take our equipment back to a compressor on shore really led us to the 2135 and 100% oxygen decompression that we ended up ultimately using. For the dive team, the project really began on September 10th of 2005. This barge was the home to many. In the top left, you see Gary Larkins. This was his 69th plane recovery. Gary drove the salvage operation and planning that was surrounded it. His team was incredible to learn from and work with. We also had the film crew. That crew was there to record everything that was going on on this for the Discovery Channel for what would ultimately become the Mega Movers episode. And then we had the riggers. 
they really were the ones who drove and, and did most of the initial work on these setups. And then they waited on us to perform our tasks so that they could actually get into work. Everything we did was only possible because of the hard work of that incredibly talented team. While the barge was being assembled, the first few members of the dive team went out and placed flags on the front and rear of the aircraft as well as took some basic video. These flags were used to locate the barge on top of the wreck. Concrete barricades like the one pictured here on the screen were placed on the barge, then moved out into place as anchors for the dive platform that we would be using. These anchors were critical for our four point mooring system, but you can see more about that in this short clip. Which is an anchor, length of chain, and then wires that would come up and attach to the buoy. Once we lay the legs of beach gear, the, the buoys would remain in place then we would attach to those buoys with large mooring lines. And we can adjust the length of those lines to move us around inside the moor. The advantage of a four-point moor is you can move around a large area to conduct diving operations. The next step was getting all of our equipment out to the barge and getting set up for operations. So what exactly are we talking about here? We're talking about going out into the middle of a lake doing dives to lift a 22,000 pound airplane from where it's rested for a very, very long time stuck in the mud. To do this, we were running those heavy straps that you see in the bottom left of the screen up underneath the wings, attaching those to spreader bars that would then be attached to the barge and be used to lift the plane up to the barge. We also knew that one engine was missing, so we didn't have exactly what one would want to consider a stable load. So did we anchor one wing down to make it more balanced? Did we put a lift bag on the other side and hold it up? Ultimately, in the end, we tried both. Here you can see me with my long-term friend and dive buddy, Brian Armstrong, before we went down for our first dive with a briefing from Chris. So what do we find on the dives? You can see here some of the silt that was piled up on one of the wings. This is a pretty clear shot. In some locations, that silt was around three to four feet deep. For most of the dives, we were completely dependent upon touch contact with the aircraft to figure out exactly where we were, started digging out, and we had basically zero visibility for most of what we did. Some of the challenges we faced weren't related to the diving itself at all. Hurricane Ophelia. She was the 15th named tropical cyclone in the 8th hurricane of the 2005 hurricane season. It was a long-lived storm that was most remembered for its very erratic and extremely slow track off the east coast of the United States. Alternated several times between tropical storm and hurricane. You can see in this photo just how much the wind made a difference to our barge and how it pushed a lot of things around. In the end, we were forced to move a lot of things around, secure things differently than we probably wanted to, but it really didn't impact us all that much operationally. Once the straps were under the wings, the next task was to kind of winch down the barge a bit. As deep as the silt was, we had to do something to kind of break the, the plane free of the bottom. We used the two buoy lines that were attached to the front and aft of the plane to show us how deep we were and use the pneumatic winches to put the pressure on the plane. It was important that we use pneumatic winches rather than hydraulic because we didn't want to contaminate the water should one of the lines break. After what seemed like an eternity, the bottom did let go and the plane started to rise up a bit. We continued dives to clean the silt off the wings and flat surfaces as well as just generally checking to make sure that the aircraft was stable. This was an extremely dynamic environment and objects started to float up to the surface that were coming off the plane. We started to have aviation fuel that was starting to leak back up towards the surface. Barriers were placed around the barge to contain the aviation fuel and the absorption process began. With the right engine not being in place on one of the subsequent dives, the divers noticed that the plane was starting to shift and had to evacuate the area and surface away from the wreck. This resulted in mist decompression that was treated with surface oxygen while we were debriefing. We were fortunate with this project not to have any decompression illness. We did have some other medical challenges. Aviation fuel pooled inside the donut-shaped barge. Avgas will really burn your skin. It's also not good for your equipment. This project is why I now have silicone seals on my DUI drive suit. Winching the plane up to the barge slowly was not without its own level of difficulty by itself. At one point, the prop fell off. 
We were lucky enough to have a line attached to that prop, but after pulling and pulling and trying different various ways to get it to the surface, unfortunately it went back to the bottom and was not recovered on this trip. I was fortunate enough to be the last diver on it that night when we finally got it to the surface and finished attaching it to the barge before the barge started to move towards shore. Unfortunately for me, that was also my last action on this trip. The real work began the next morning after it arrived on shore. As artifacts were removed in shallow water, we started finding things that everybody was surprised. Who knew the 50 caliber guns would still be in place? A water lift was built that would allow us to filter out the mud and silt from inside the wreck and around the outside edges to make sure that no artifacts were lost or destroyed. With a crane attached and the barge removed, the aircraft took its final flight on the 19th of September in 2005. Once it was on shore, this aircraft showed just how incredibly unique it really was. It's the only B-25 known to have a bottom turret. It's the second oldest B-25 in the world. and It's one of three B-25C models in existence. The team also discovered that the pilot and crew had scratched the names of their wives and girlfriends into the paint on the outside of the fuselage. The bombardier from this flight, Mr. Henry Mescal, is the only one of the crew that survived World War II. At one point in time during the research for this project, he described the fact that he had lost his lucky hat during ditching this aircraft. The team found the leather straps that were all that remained of that hat. After this good initial cleaning, the aircraft was loaded onto trucks and then shipped down to the Southern Museum of Flight where it resides today in Birmingham, Alabama. Many parts of the aircraft can be found on display already. The silt in this image really shows just how deep it actually was in the cockpit. You can use the red plastic controls to kind of give you an idea of, of where each of these images came from. The ventral turret recovered on this aircraft is one of the things that makes this so incredibly unique. This project was featured on the History Channel show Mega Movers on May 2nd of 2006. The project was also a featured exhibit in the South Carolina State Museum. This was an incredible project, and I was very lucky to have been able to take some small part. I love this picture of me on the right. This was a truly incredible experience. The picture on the right actually shows Brian and Heather getting married after they started dating here. Really hope you enjoyed this presentation as much as I enjoyed taking this look back. I really appreciate you all helping us get to 100 subscribers and requesting that I post this video. While this does seem a bit off-brand to start, it is important to realize that everything we did out here did involve a tremendous amount of teamwork, collaboration, and practice. This project brought together many multidisciplinary types of professionals. Please subscribe, click like, and take a look at one of these other videos while you're visiting.